All right. Hello, Alberts List, and welcome. We hope you're having a safe week out there amid this COVID-19 pandemic. We seem to have gone over a curve, as it sounds like a lot of businesses are reopening. All right. So it being Monday, we're continuing our mock interview series. Back with us today is Corey Hiramoto, Fortune 5 recruiter and founder of PureShakers.com. He's a Santa Clara graduate, former management consultant, and also from the great state of Hawaii. With him is Michael Owen, a creative, a not a creative writer, excuse me, that's last week's script. He's a mid-level software engineer, and he's based here in Silicon Valley with really great experience at companies like Zoox, Udacity, and Guidewire. The rules of today's live video are pretty simple. I'm going to step back in a moment, so I'm going to let Corey and Michael do their work. You'll see... Uh, yeah, you'll see Corey's resume on screen with a, not Corey, excuse me, Michael's screen, Michael's resume on screen with a job that he wants to apply to. And Corey will be asking all the questions. I'll be returning when the webinar is just about to conclude. And each and every one of you who are watching at this moment can go ahead and offer your thoughts, your opinions, and any types of cheering that you want as Michael puts himself out there to conduct this video. All right, Corey, over to you. Perfect. Thank you. And so, yes, uh, we'd definitely love to see some great interactions and comments in the thread. Also, let us know if there's any burning interview questions or tough interview questions that you are wondering about. And then we can also uh, run through some of those as well. In terms of the format of today, what's going to happen is I'm going to run Michael through a set of non-technical interview questions um, focused around his job description. And I'll be jumping back and forth between the job description and his resume. Um, today's job is at one of my favorite companies, Google. Um, Michael is interested potentially at a software engineering role at Google. Um, and it's a pretty generic job description. So um, we'll keep it very broad in terms of like just Google as a company itself. And then I've crafted questions around the non-technical portion of the interview. For those of you who are interested in working at Google or um, getting ready for interviews, um, all of the preparatory preparation materials and things like that are publicly available. This is public knowledge. If you literally just go to Google and it's, if you go to Google and you type in Google interviews, this is the very first um, non ad link that will come up and it's actually on Google's career website. So it is legitimate information and it's pretty transparent in terms of what they're going to cover um, both phone interviews as well as on sites and it covers both the technical and non technical questions that you will get. And I just want to point out that there are basically four different attributes that they're going to be assessing during the interview process. I'm sure Michael already knows because he's been preparing for this diligently, I am sure. And so these are the areas in which I crafted the questions on to help Michael get prepared. So GCA, leadership, role-related knowledge, and Googliness, or essentially culture fit, um, is the four areas that Michael is going to be practicing. Now, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time, this is, I believe, week six or seven, I think, that we're doing this in a row. Um, in the past, we've also um, done different job areas like nonprofit, marketing, product management, et cetera, et cetera. And then some of the different areas that we've tried to give feedback on, if you were curious or these uh, situations apply to you, would be re-entering the workforce. Um, having changed job, jobs or companies quite a few times, um, trying to do a career change, as well as moving from an individual contributor role into a managerial role. So if any of those situations or scenarios apply to you, take a look at some of our previous mock interviews. So um, that's the little plug of what's going to happen today and kind of what we're going to be talking about. And then I'll just kick it over to Michael if he wants to do a quick little introduction. Otherwise, we will dive right in. Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, yeah, my name is Michael Owens. Um, I'm an uh, alumni of UC Davis. I uh, graduated with a bachelor's in genetics, but been coding since I was 13. Um, what got me into, like, what got me to pivot into the tech space was, uh, you know, after I was working in some labs and interns, internships um, during undergraduate and a little bit after uh, graduation, kind of started to feel like the, uh, you know, the atmosphere wasn't really for me. Um, in in biolab academia, especially, it, it really feels not, it's not really a team environment. It's more like you're, it, it felt like you're trying to like fight for credit all the time, recognition, 
and you don't really get to leverage like your peers knowledge um because then it's like oh maybe their name gets to be on the paper and you're fighting for first author now so during that time um i also noticed that like startups like uber was taking off and coding boot camps were were like really starting to pick up as well and i felt like the original reason why i went into the biospace was because i wanted to be a pioneer and i wanted to uh, you know, make a positive impact on the world. But I just didn't see the timeline fitting to like to what I was expecting. For for bio research, you, you know, you write, you do a lot of wet lab experiments, you gather data, you draw some, you do some analysis, and then, you know, maybe it gets published, maybe it gets picked up by a pharmaceutical company, gets turned into a drug, and maybe gets, uh, you know, available to those, to those people in need. So that's a lot of maybes, but with tech, I think, especially in uh, software, you can uh, you know you can write a couple lines of code. I mean, it's very simple. It's oversimplifying, but you can write a couple lines of code and you can see a result immediately. Um, yeah, that, that's that's a quick intro, I guess. That's awesome. And um, I'll have Michael's resume up and would we'll be jumping back and forth between that and the job description. But as you can see, Michael's worked at a lot of really great companies. He's worked at four different companies so far and is now at Zooks. So Michael, I guess for anyone who is interested in the software engineering space or is already a software engineer, since you've been so successful with all these different interview processes, what are like some, you know, tips and tricks you've gotten or, or, or advice you have about interviewing? Um, yeah, sure. So there are typically uh, two main skills that I tend to focus on for interviewing. Um, one is kind of easy to prepare for. You kind of just do mock interviews like this. And that's what I would say, uh, tell your story. So um, generally, just like haven't have a like tell your story in terms of like where you started, how you like what were your motivations from each role and like what got you interested? What do you care about? Um, the second interview skill, uh, which is mostly for the technical people is, is, uh, being able to like solve interview problems, uh, technical problems, as well as communicate your ideas. Um, yeah. So, uh, the first, the first skill, I think if you just talk to people and you tell them where you came from, and if you can like, uh, tell them in a reasonable amount of time and they get an idea of like what you're looking for. And then I think you're doing pretty well there. The second skill is more, I think, trial and error. So it took me a while to kind of figure this out. I'm still trying to figure it out, honestly. Um, initially, when I started up, I would just apply and I would just apply for anything I could get. Um, and then the, every interview is, is kind of different because I'm more on the front end side of things. I, I work more like more, more on things on the browser. Uh, I, I tend to get less data structure and algorithm questions and more domain specific questions. So, but I've heard for like backend engineers, you get more data structure and system design questions. So to practice those, um, you know, you, you probably hear about like leak code, um, cracking the coding interview. Uh, these are all great resources, but I think at the end of the day, um, what's most important is that you understand the fundamentals that your coursework has has hopefully you know taught you uh, things like um, you know sorting, recursion, graphs, trees, uh, dynamic programming, um, and then for system design, I think the uh, I think like there's a really popular website called like highly scale highly scalable or something. Um, don't really remember, but uh, yeah, that's I, I haven't really. I think system design is also like naturally learned through just trial and error and building your own side projects. So I try and I try and like, like kind of balance during my job search is like, uh, you know, drill questions, uh, review weaknesses, and then also build build something on, on the site. Nice. That was actually a very comprehensive answer. And we didn't really prep Michael for this ahead of time and he nailed it. That was great. I was even going to ask about different resources and he already talked about it. So for those software engineers who are watching this or watching the recording later on, Michael uh, seems to have a great wealth of knowledge of great prep materials and things. And so I guess with that, we will dive on into the mock interview practice. And again, we're going to do the non-technical interview prep. Um, so just that way the most amount of people can learn from the mock interviews that we're doing and then 
Michael gave you guys really great resources to help practice and prepare for the technical um, side of the house. So, Michael, are you ready? Here we go. Um, and I've got my handy little uh, sheet here for those of you who are wondering what I keep looking at. This is where I wrote all of Michael's handcrafted questions. So question number one, Michael, thank you for applying to Google. We are super excited to speak with you. Why don't you walk me through your resume? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, uh, as I mentioned in my intro, I, uh, you know, I, I kind of transitioned to tech about, uh, shortly, like a little bit after I graduated. Um, although I don't have a computer science degree, I, do, I did take a lot of coursework at, at Davis and, and in high school as well. So I felt like my, my fundamentals were, you know, they're, they're, they're there enough for an internship, but not enough for a full-time role because I'd be competing with other computer science degrees that also have likely internship experience. Um, so what, what kind of what drew me to the space was, uh, you know, the, the idea of the startup and being able to make an impact on the world. So I thought, you know, I really want to pursue a role, an internship role in one of these small startups. So 500 Miles was a uh, four person startup, including me. Uh, it was a data driven recruiting platform that connects students, and young professionals to startups. So the, the problem on the candidate side is that as a as a candidate you're handing a lot of information your resume to employers but you're not really getting much in return outside of you know maybe the intro call and what you can find online so the idea is to be able to not only suggest these lesser known companies uh, as start known as startups to people that sign up but also give them an overview of what the company might look like statistically so um after you sign up with your LinkedIn and some information, like answer some questions, uh, maybe upload a resume, you can you get a feed of suggested startups based off of um, suggestion algorithm. And then you can tap into detail views of each company. So the detail views will be a list of charts, things like headcount over the years, uh, where they get their talent from in terms of schooling or previous companies. Uh, where they raise their funding from, how much funding they've raised, like what stage they're at in terms of funding, uh, the level of seniority, as well as the attrition rate, like hires versus departures. And then on the uh, employer side of the app, the web enterprise app, which is what I owned and was essentially the solo developer, um, you can post job ads. And those job ads are will appear in the in the uh, candidate app. And then they can, the candidates can apply directly through that app. So when I first joined, that was the only feature on the web enterprise app was that can, uh, employers could only post jobs. Uh, they can't do anything else. Uh, in addition, um, the company was still collecting paper checks in the mail. So not, not very scalable as you sign on more customers. So the, the, first, um, the first feature I did was a leadership board, like a leaderboard. So to see like which startups are, are most like gaining most interest among among user, users. Uh, the second was a billing, uh, a billing flow. So I implemented like a, a full stack solution to for not only like new users, but also existing users so that they don't have to send paper checks in the mail anymore every month. Um, the final feature was, uh, I think at the peak, we had like something like 50,000 users across the country. Um, th that's like a lot of data. That's like a lot of user data. And um, posting job ads is kind of like a passive form of recruiting. I think an active form of recruiting would be like being able to seek out candidates uh, by keywords and filters and certain criteria, which is the, the last feature that I implemented, which is candidate search. Um, so unfortunately, the company, like, so when I first joined 500 Miles, like I was looking for an internship to like a full-time opportunity. And I made this very clear in the beginning. And the what, what they told me was, the CTO told me was, um, you know, it kind of depends on two things, which is one is my performance and then two is the, the timing for raising money. So I think I delivered pretty well on, on what they expected me to deliver. And, you know, when it, when it came time to, to be the end of my internship term, uh, I wasn't really even approached about it. Um, I just, I had to bring it up. I was like, oh, so like, what's the funding status? And he's like, oh, we, you know, it's really hard market right now. We, we, we haven't been able to raise. 
Uh, I was like, okay, well, uh, yeah, tomorrow, like today is like my last day. He's like, oh, do you want to join on? Do you want to continue? I'm like, I mean, are you going to hire me full time? He's like, oh, we can't. I'm like, oh, sorry, but like, thanks for, it was a really good opportunity. Like I learned a lot, but I think I really need to find some full time. So unfortunately I had to, I had to look for alternative, um, you know, a new role. So that, that landed me at Guidewire. Um, I chose Guidewire because it's a very large company, like over a thousand people. And it's very different from 500 miles. It's a completely different industry. It's insurance software um, for insurance companies to run their business, like State Farm, Geico, like uh, you name it. Um, but I also didn't want to lose the urgency of, of like delivering and, and shipping um, that 500 miles had. Because I've heard that, you know, insurance software, they tend to be on a two year release cycle, which means uh, what, you, what you write will only go out to production like two years later. And I, I didn't I didn't really like that idea. Like I wanted to have impact now. So uh, the team that I landed on was the internal framework team. So Gu Guidewire's like main products is called Insurance Suite, which is built on a proprietary framework called Sencha, uh, or sorry, not Sencha, EXTJS, which is developed by Sencha. And that, that has run its course for like, you know, seven years. So it's time to to upgrade the suite product, the like the framework that the suite products are built on. So um, the cool thing about this team was is it like this is the time when like React was really picking up. So I wanted I heard about React. I wanted to work with React, and I also wanted to like see what it'd be like to develop tooling because in a way I did I like my last role I developed like a consumer uh, a business tool. This this time it's like a tool for internal use. Um, and so that, that consisted of, you know, writing library components, um, kind of trying to abstract the complicated bits of React for the suite developers to be able to onboard. And, uh, you know, we did have about two stakeholders, two teams consuming this framework. And, you know, I got to work with them. I got to, got to work cross-functionally, work with a designer. Um, it's pretty cool. Um, but, you know, after a year, there was about, there hey, was Michael, a, there I'm was so a, sorry, but um, uh, would you mind just kind of skipping a little bit farther ahead into maybe your more recent role? Just oh, yeah, for sure. the um, purpose of time. Sure, sure. sure. So, so Zoox is an autonomous, so uh, autonomous vehicle company uh, trying to build level five autonomous software and, the, and a vehicle for level five autonomous driving from the ground up. Um, I was in the infrastructure inter and internal tooling team. There's uh, so developing autonomous vehicle software looks kind of like this. You like write software, you run a simulation, and then you put that software on on the vehicle. You drive it around SF and or you drive it around like a city. And the soft not only is the software logging the state of the vehicle, but also the vehicle operators are noting down any bugs. And so we have to be able to take this data from the vehicle and then be able to. Uh, triage it to the correct team and the team needs to be the teams need to be able to inspect the state of the, the vehicle uh, at any given time so the problem is that i think a um, couple months before i joined there was like a bunch of tools there's a, there's a lot of fragmentation in the tooling because um, every team developed their own tool for their own specific use case but sometimes there would be crossovers in terms of use case but it wouldn't be like 100 percent and there's also compatibility issues. Like some tools are built on Unreal, which isn't compatible with certain systems. So Argus is a, uh, it's a essentially like a data visualization replayer tool. So you're, that's that's built in the web, and it solves the problem of like all these different, like having all these different tools, because you're able to configure however you want, um, like configure the tool to your need based off like based off the widget and the layout system. It's very similar to uh, Cruise's web biz tool, if you've seen that. Um, so I, so what I worked on at, on Argus was, the main features were uh, implementing di diagnostics timeline, uh, enabling audio playback, uh, marking perception obstacles, and um, enabling user feedback flow. So I can go into like more implementation detail of that, or I'm um, not really sure like what else you would want to know. Okay, 
Um, we'll just pause the scenario there. So okay. um, Michael gave a really deep and in-depth uh, overview. Um, I think the answer where you were, I think, trying to go right is kind of like storytelling almost, which is good. Uh, but that's more for like a tell me about yourself type question. Um, this one was a little bit more direct, right? They were asking you to specifically just kind of walk them through your resume. And when someone asks you that, what they're essentially trying to do is have you guide them and highlight certain aspects, projects, skills, languages, right? Technology that would be really relevant for the role that you're going to be applying for. And so in your story for that type of, uh, of response, right, you would pull out the little bits and pieces from each of your different companies, or maybe only just one or two that are really relevant for what you're applying for in this specific case, a software engineering role at Google. So in terms of a length of time, like a walk me through your resume type thing should probably be somewhere between maybe a minute to like a minute and a half, maybe two minutes on the longer side. And so there's a lot of, detail that I feel like you don't necessarily have to give all the time, right? Like explaining like what 500 miles was, how big the co company was, like how the conversations were going between you and the CTO at the end of your internship, right? Um, I feel like a lot of that could just be summarized. And even, even sometimes I don't even need as much background about the product itself or anything like that, right? I'm more interested in your skill set and like what projects you did and your experience. And so I think if you were to double down on, the, on that, it, it would be a much more powerful story. If that makes sense. But overall, it seems like you have like both really good business knowledge as well as the technical expertise, which I think really shines through in how you've currently been answering the question, but I would focus more on like condensing it down and highlighting and focusing more on the skill set itself, right? And then I will just check the chat here to see if anyone has any questions. Everyone's saying, woohoo, good job, Michael. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Cool. Uh, yeah, if you guys have any questions, comments, difficult interview questions you want us to run through, put them in the chat and we will try and get through all of it. So next question, Michael, are you ready? Yep. So what would you say is your greatest weakness? Um, so this kind of relates back to when I was working at 500 miles, uh, because it was such a small team, it was kind of like, I felt a lot of pressure to be autonomous and kind of unblock myself because when I would ask for help, um, the, you know, it's, it's not really within their expertise on this part of the, the web stack. So um, I, I do, I think like later in my career, it kind of, uh, I do have trouble asking for help sometimes or noticing when I'm like starting to like spin wheels. Um, so usually what I do is I will like set a timer of like, you know, around 30 minutes. And when the timer goes off, then I'll ask somebody that I think will know, or if they don't know, I'll ask them like, oh, do you know someone that's more of an expert on this domain? Okay, yeah. so what is your weakness? If I'm trying to play it um, back. I, my, my, my greatest weakness is not knowing when to like ask for help. Not knowing when to ask for help, got it. Okay, and then what are you, I guess, working on to, I guess, improve on that? Um, so I said that I would, I would like, now what I would do is I, I set a timer for like 30 minutes and I had like, after the 30 minutes, I, I, you know, I would have some people in mind that I would go to, to ask for help. And if, if, you know, if they don't know, then I would ask them like, do, like, do, would they know anyone that knows, like, that has like a greater expertise in this, in this domain? Got it. And so you wouldn't try and find resources on your own to, I guess. Um... So, so the, the 30 minute timer is, is basically me like setting a limit for me trying to unblock myself. So that does entail like finding, seeking out documentation on my own, Googling stack overflow, looking at um, other, other parts of the code base to see if there's any reusable pattern, things like that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So um, my follow-up questions there were essentially kind of like dive deeper into your answer overall. Um, it was kind of hard to understand what you were saying the weakness itself was. And 
also I think like from an interview perspective, right? I feel like no matter where you work or whatever job you have, you're always going to need some help, right? You won't know everything about everything all the time. And so that that's why I was asking like, what are you doing to improve it? And then I guess like the ultimate answer is like, you can't really, right? Like you're always going to need some help. And so I think perhaps maybe selecting a different weakness um, would be something that would be really helpful for you. Essentially what we're trying to understand basically is like, this is kind of like a softball-ish question where there's no, I would say right answer, but there's definitely wrong answers, right? You don't wanna give a weakness that is critical to performing the role itself because that would be an immediate red flag for the interviewer or the hiring manager. Um, but you also wanna be able to talk about something in which you are showing that you're working to improve it, right? And that's kind of what I was trying to get at with with you was like maybe like yes everyone does need to ask for help or know when to ask for help but like it's it's even hard just to think about like a potential solution to help show someone that you're working on fixing it you know what i mean um do you have like another potential weakness that that you may want to use instead um i guess i'm not really well balanced as a as an engineer like uh, my my expertise tends to be on the client side so like i'm i'm pretty deep into front end engineering um so i guess when it comes to understanding like back end data architecture um i i do have a weakness in that so the the way i try to cover for that is usually i look for any documentation or any does like any RFCs, like past RFCs that have already been implemented to try and get an understanding of like the overall how, how the system is designed. Um, that, and then like, if there is resource, for, um, then like I would ask my mentor or someone that is like an expert on that to just give me like a general, like brief overview of like what's going on. What about like a, like a non-technical weakness? non-technical weakness and the reason why i'm trying to steer you away from using that one as well is because if you don't know the context of the role itself right you don't want to admit that you have a gap that is directly relevant for the role right yes. like oh i'm not good at blank and then they're going to be like well michael actually you know in this position or you know here at google for a lot of our engineers you know we we hope that people are familiar with you know blah blah blah, blah, blah. and then you would have essentially accidentally eliminated yourself from the running you know what i mean so yeah, I, I'm, I'm going to push you towards like not something non-technical because A, it may not be a critical component of the role and B, it's much easier to show that you're working on it, right? Like for, for me, when I was interviewing, when I was coming out of school, which is a little bit different now, but um, because I knew I wouldn't be giving lots of presentations anyways, because I'm like a recent college grad, like who's going to put me in front of a VP or whatever, I would just say like, oh, my greatest weakness currently is public speaking. But this is what I'm doing to work on it. I'm, you know, going to Toastmasters, I'm taking a public speaking course, I'm going to be speaking in front of, you know, 100 people this weekend, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera, right? It's like a soft skill that's not really required for the role, but I was able to show that I've, you know, self aware, but I'm also sh working on it um maybe maybe try some say yeah some type of soft skill some type of soft skill yeah and and don't pick one that's like i don't play well with others or like <laughs> um you know i don't like my boss uh you know like uh, try and try and pick something a little bit easier you know hmm. uh, it's kind of interesting because like I hear this like as like a pretty general behavioral question overall, but I've never actually been asked this before. So it's, it's kind of, I, I, it's kind of hard for me to think of on the spot right now. Okay. Um, no worries, no worries. We can circle back or this is just something you can kind of think about um, okay. as well. So Albert was saying, um, talk about how you think too much and how that enables you to make better coding decisions. Like, I guess that could be so, like, like a, like a weakness, right? It's like, sometimes I, or like, don't say I'm a, I'm a perfectionist. Um, that's like the worst answer ever, but it's kind of like, sometimes I like to over, you know, so occasionally I may overcomplicate certain problems when there could be a much simpler solution, you know, and then, you know, I'm trying to find ways to, you know, simplify my thinking, et cetera, et cetera. But I've also noticed that there are times where it helps me some solve more complex coding situations for example there was a time when blah 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 right it's kind of like trying to turn your weakness into a strength almost if that makes sense um albert was saying 
for a technical role, how long should the walk me through your resume answer be, especially since technology roles can be super granular and detailed? Yeah, um, I would still say probably like two, two to two and a half minutes max. Um, again, right, like you got to understand the job itself. So maybe you have the interviewer or the hiring manager go first and explain what they're looking for or what the role would entail. And then you should be able to pull out the different parts of your experience and background that are much that are the most relevant. And I would focus on the more recent stuff as opposed to going um, backwards, as opposed to going forwards in time. Yeah, so I would I would focus more on the recent stuff. And then I would try and pull out and highlight those experiences for that person. And it should, should, it should still only be like two to two and a half minutes, right? For example, like if you wanted to describe 500 miles, right, which is I'm sure a highly complex or, or, or why don't we go with Zooks, right? Autonomous driving, right? Um, you could just say, oh yeah, I was at, I was at Zooks, which as you probably know is, is related to autonomous driving. And what I was working on is called Argus. Argus is, you know, a 3D visualization app that allows us to do blah, 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 right? That was maybe what, eight seconds. Now at Zooks, I was mainly working on Argus, which which relied me, you know, which had me, you know, coding mostly in blah 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 blah. I made some really great progress. We we're able to do boom 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 boom, right? So maybe that's like your first thirty seconds, but that's only you're only going to talk about the the coding skills or whatever projects or whatever whatever backend systems tools technology etc. that you know would be relevant for the interviewer to hear. Does that kind of make sense? Yes. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. All right. This is good. We're getting a lot of good stuff here, Michael. This is awesome. Thank you again for doing this. And you're doing great, by the way. Oh, no problem. Th thanks for your time. Yeah, no worries. So I will give you some context and also give you some time to kind of prep as well. So um, on the Google interview prep website, um, these are the four different things that they're going to be um, obviously assessing all the different candidates on. And so one of them is general cognitive ability. And basically it's just problem solving, right? So um, this is gonna be your problem solving question. Michael, imagine we hired you here at Google and I asked you to open up a zoo. Google wants to open up a zoo and I put you in charge. Walk me through your, your thought process about how you would go about you know, organizing and then eventually opening up a zoo for Google. Okay. Uh, well, first, I would need to know the budget and timeline, uh, and you know, alloc like allocated resource resources for this zoo. Um, so, I guess I, if I don't know the constraints of like what we're building, then it, it's pretty hard to like go off of that, right? Because we don't want to go over budget. We right. don't want to build. We don't want to build a zoo that comes too late or too early, and. Mm -hmm. I guess I would also want to know like the business impact of the zoo at Google. So like, is this zoo for, like for charity? Is it for uh, like employ employee wellness, things like that, right? Um, okay, so do you want me to like respond to those oh, uh, questions? Yes, yes, please. Okay, so in terms of budget, uh, let's just say it's unlimited for now because we're Google, yeah. right? And um, timeline. Okay, so uh, we would like the zoo to be built in two years, like ready to be opened, customers coming in in two years. Um, in terms of the overall business purpose of it, um, it's, uh, it's for, it's just for um, great advertising. Um, it's not for employees only, it's gonna be open to the public. Okay. Um, so, okay. So we have two years, um, two years time, unlimited budget, and it's more for like marketing, open like advertising, open to the public to show off how awesome Google is, right? Um, so with that in mind, then uh, I would think, uh, you know, first we'd have to scope out like, uh, like where, like what, like where we would want to have the zoo, like. If it's for the public, I would imagine that, um, you know, a, a, an area with high traffic, so we have high exposure um, to like expose people to this zoo so that they, they'll be able to, you know, see like, oh, hey, it's Google Zoo. It's, it's that awesome zoo, right? Um, so because we have an unlimited budget that, that enables that, right? And 
I think two years is, is like not long, but it's also not short. So I think we would need some people to that, like, I'm not an expert in building a zoo. So I think we should look for experts that are like experts that are, you know, have experience building a zoo. So things like an architect, maybe a designer. Um, we also need to be able to source the animals as well. Like, are there any restrictions on, on sourcing the animals? Uh, like, do we want to prove, like what kind of animals can, like, can we, can we house like, or put in the zoo uh, that fall within also like uh, state and game wildlife laws? Uh, let's see, what else? Um, I would also think like, is it only going to be a zoo with animals or do we want to like, like you know, some zoos, they have amusement parks, they have uh, shows, they have restaurants. Uh, do we want to include this as well? Do we want to uh, do we, like, what are the business op, like how, how often do we want to have the zoo open? Um, like how much, like, do we expect the zoo to generate revenue? Uh, or is it just going to be purely for advertising to give to the public? Like, do we even charge the public? Thing like that, right? Um, what else? Uh, do we, I guess, the, um, do we allow like hosting? Like maybe a company wants to run their offsite there and they want to run a, run a zoo there. Uh, what about handling liabilities? Like we need to also like make sure the, the zoo is up to code, like animals don't get out, uh, people don't jump into the tiger pit. Um, uh, yeah, and then there's other things we can also consider, like how much do how much do we want to like? Uh, so like I think zoos tend to be kind of like similar to museums, except that you're like, like in the sense that uh, you know there's a lot of information there. There's usually like some signs with details about the animals, or you know it's it's essentially like an interactive learning environment. So. Um, what kind of events do we want to organize there as well? So I think, uh, but initially building it is like sourcing materials, sourcing animals, um, getting all the, uh, you know, the paperwork done in terms of the zoning and like, like state and, and federal and, and government uh, manage, like hiring people to, to manage the zoo, like running payroll. Uh, is, there's a lot of stuff to consider. Um, so, yeah, I think that that basically covers it. <laughs> okay. Now, how would your approach change if I told you you didn't have a, an unlimited budget and it was five hundred million? Um, so I, again, I think it would go back to like, do we expect the zoo to be profitable or like not lose money at least? And uh, yeah, I think that that's probably the first thing that I would have to consider. Um, well, we definitely don't well, want to lose money, right? We definitely don't want to lose yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like, how how long do you expect to have the zoo like reaccrue its cost? Like, um, five hundred million. Huh? Okay, so probably would also have to do like we probably would have, would want to do research on like other zoos' models and like the most successful zoos in terms of like what are most profitable or what. Like I think San Diego Zoo is, is pretty famous, right? I think it's famous because it's not only large and has a diverse, um, you know, uh, an, like diverse set of animals, but also the the staff is pretty knowledgeable. the the air the the land they built it on is is very is varied. Um, it allows for like different kinds of habitats for those animals in their in their areas. Um, but uh, yeah, so if we don't have 500 million, I think we would have to cut the extra programs, things like uh, maybe maybe you can't, you know, just maybe you have to, like you probably have to charge uh, like entry, right? And you have, you uh, so like you probably have to start with like, what are the must haves? Like you must have zoning, you must have people to manage, like take care of the animals, you must have, um, like all the paperwork done for um, for zoning. I think I said that already, sorry. Um, you have to source the animals, right? Uh, you have to also consider uh, like m like feeding the animals too, right? So these are these are all things that you probably wanna consider. And then maybe you don't wanna, maybe you don't wanna uh, like fill the entire zoo 
all at once. Maybe you only want to fill the zoo partly and then um, match match the like um, like as you get more customers, then you can you can bring in more animals and you can build more traction, I guess. Uh, because I guess when you introduce like a zoo into a, a new area, um, like I remember when the Oakland Zoo was first built, like it was really hot, but then it kind of just like declined a little bit, but then it got hot again because they re remodeled it, right? So um, that's that's what I would think. Like, I think you, I think the main difference is we would just cut like a lot of the like extra nice to haves, but we would still keep the must haves. Okay, cool. Now, um, so this was obviously a very, very difficult question. Um, <laughs> And I threw a bit of a twist in it at the end, um, just because. Well, and also on the Google website, it does say that that you should be prepared for that, right? Um, predict the future, have a backup plan, explain, um, and yeah. So there are going to be follow-up questions that you will have to deal with. And one of the things that they will probably do is change one of the factors. And in this case, I change a factor of budget. I gave you a limited budget, and then I obviously shrunk it. And then I wanted you to walk through like what specifically would change because now you have a budget. Right. So overall, I think Michael had a lot of really great ideas, which is why I get smiling all the time, because I was like, oh, I never really thought about zoning or like, um, oh, yeah, running programs and having signs and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So that's why I was smiling, because Michael was throwing out a lot of really good ideas. But I think two things would really help. First is having some structure to follow. Right. If you think about it, all the ideas that you had could probably be bucketed and organized into maybe like two or three different categories. Right. The first would be like operations related stuff. Right. The second would be maybe like um, finance stuff. And then the, the, the third thing would be like uh, you, you mentioned like paying zookeepers and and, and uh, I don't know, zoning and stuff. So I don't know, like uh, HR or whatever. Right. Um, and then what that would, would essentially do is a it gives the interviewer something easy to follow. Like I know you're going to talk about operations first, then you're gonna talk about finances and then you're gonna talk about HR. And also it gives you like an end, right? Cause I could sense you didn't know how the question would, would be done, like, like how your answer would, would essentially be finished, right? Cause you just kept like throwing out great ideas and then at the end you were like, and yeah, right? Um, so I think the structure helps. Also, the second thing that's really gonna help a lot is not wording everything as a question. Right, because um, they are asking you to pro provide some type of plan, right? And if you just kept, if you just only ask questions as your answer to an interview, you're therefore not answering a question. You're just answering a question with more questions, right? Like, how would you open the zoo? How much budget do I have? How many animals would there be? Um, where do I build it? What about the what about the building code? Right, like some like some of these are are obviously great questions that you need to think about, but you need to provide some hypothetical or fake answers or recommendations, right? So that's the other thing that I think is really gonna help is if you can turn some of those questions into more statements um, because that's what they're overall looking for, right? Essentially. And so, and the other thing that Michael did really good that I wanna point out for everyone else as well is he asked clarifying questions before he started to immediately tell me all the different factors to consider when building a zoo. So that's also something you guys should do as well is think about what questions you wanna ask that will help refine and drive your story. So you just don't start like spitting out ideas without knowing any of the context. So um, Michael asked me about budget as well as timeline, uh, which I think are both valid questions that would affect and change how you answer it, the question. Uh, one of the things that I talk about all the time is you don't wanna waste some of the questions that, that you can ask in the beginning. You can probably ask maybe one to three questions before you start to, to dive in. If you ask more than that, then it just seems like you're just trying to get an answer from the person. And so don't try and waste your question. So for example, a wasted question would be if Michael asked me, well, does it, does it matter if, if there's certain types of animals in there? And I would say, well, that's why we chose you to build the zoo, right? You tell me, what types of animals we should have inside the zoo, right? Like, should we have water animals or only land-based animals? Like, obviously there's gonna be some budget constraints, right? Because I'm sure water animals are more expensive because you gotta like buy a big tank and you gotta put the water in it and like, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, those are all like things that they would expect you to answer in your response. So asking it to the interviewer would essentially like kind of waste the question. But uh, yeah, Michael did really good for like a very difficult question overall.
And it, it was essentially designed just to understand his problem solving ability and it's not related to the role itself. So there was no coding elements at all on purpose. Cool. Alrighty, let me just check the chat. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, Albert was laughing. Google has infinite dollars and all the animals. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. Okay. Next question. Michael, tell me about a time that you had to solve a very complex problem. Um, okay. So uh example was enabling audio in Argus. So I didn't um so Argus, as I said, is a, is, a, is like a playback tool. Um, and we have over 40 different kinds of sensors on the vehicle. And uh, one, of, one of them, like one of the type of sensors are microphones, right? So the problem was, was complex in the sense that the data format that we record audio in is different, is not web compatible with, is not web compatible for, for playback. So the, the, the steps I had to figure out like how to solve this problem were like, one is like how to get data off the vehicle. Like where is the data being stored? How do we get it off the vehicle? And how do we, how do we um, uh, you know, process this data? Um, yeah, so how do we get it off the vehicle? So two, we have to process it so that it's web compatible, right? So that not only, that not only entails transcoding from one format to another, but we also have to edit it as well because sometimes the data that we collect is not um, continuous. So what does that mean? Uh, if you have like a six, if you drive for 60 minutes, you might not have 60 minutes of data. So what do you do with that gap, right? Um, so that's all right. And then we have to process this data for every run. Um, so how do we set up a pipeline such that every time we finish a run, the data get uh, the audio data is is pulled, processed, and then put into a spot that is easily to be retrievable. All right, and then so that's that's like the data infrastructure side of things. Um, on the client side, I had never worked with audio playback before. I know there is a you know HTML5 audio widget, but I wasn't exactly sure like how it worked. So I needed to read like docs on like how audio works, um, how like because there is a bit built in. Uh, like web audio uh, li uh, library for web, um, like uh, so that's that's one of that's one of the things. Another thing is like how do I stream like like what kind of data loading approach do I want to do? Because if I load just you know sixty minutes of audio data, that could that could take a really long time, and we could block people from being able to use the UI and playback audio. Um, or so probably so I ended up considering like a, a streaming approach um and then yeah and then okay then finally because there's eight different there's eight microphones on the vehicle like how do we want to enable that means there's eight streams so how do we want to enable playback for all the different eight streams like what does the ui look like what does the experience look like and what should they hear if can do we allow them to select all the microphones and none of the microphones or do we allow them to select any number of microphones and play, the, play those on top of each other. Um, and like, what should it look like when there's no audio, like when there's those bits of like where audio wasn't recorded. So th these are things to consider. Um, the reason why it was difficult was because it was, uh, it was a domain that I was not experienced with at all. And like I was touching all parts of the stack and yeah, it was just it was a never it was a problem I've never seen before, and I, I just never worked with it. Okay, and then walk me through your solutions or different um, ideas that you had. Yeah, sure. Mm. So uh, there's only a limited number of web compatible formats, so I ended up deciding to convert to a wave format, which is a set. So we were recording in raw. And converting it to a wave uh, format is, is very simple. It's just um, adding a wave header. So what, the header contains information like how large is the file? Uh, it, it tells itself it's a wave type, things like that, right? Um, so that's that's 
that's the format that's that's uh we've we've decided um retrieving data off of the vehicle uh ne like was not a problem that is unique to me it was like anyone that wanted to work with audio data like audio perception team needed to be able to retrieve audio off the, off the vehicle so the solution there is to write an audio library uh, audio c++ library so the the library has functions like um being able to select a run uh load that data um stitch it stitch it together with um so like where there where there are gaps uh where there are gaps in like data not being recorded i just fill it with an empty with uh no noise and then that way we're able to just have one contiguous fi uh file as opposed to a bunch of small f files that are you know cut off because there was interruption in recording um the next so the next part is like how do you process the data every every run um luckily zooks has a, a internal compute cluster and they have they have a you know they can run jobs on that cluster so after every run there's there's a script that runs all these jobs for every run so i added my script that i wrote that that utilizes the audio library to essentially convert that data uh, to transcribe that raw, that raw audio data into wave wave format data and then dump it into s3 so and then on the front end uh what i tried was um what i first tried was loading the individual bits because i didn't think to like stitch them together uh that has problems because when when you're trying to play back audio you're not you're usually not just playing back audio because you have other sensors and you need to sync up all the data timestamps with as close to possible um having to like start like load an audio like you have to first first of all you don't even know from the client side like if there's audio data available um you probably have to like develop some like side infrastructure like some additional infrastructure to say like oh here here's where we got audio data so um the first the first iteration was like creating a file that, that told uh the client like where there's audio data available and then loading the data whenever you get close to that timestamp um that was that seemed very complicated because you would have to do that for every single run uh set um finally i ended up just stitch like coming up with the solution which was to stitch all the audio data together with um spaced out with um empty noise when there's no audio being recorded and letting letting the uh, HTML5 audio audio tag just handle the the streaming. So, because the audio tag can take a source like like S3 file uh, S3 bucket, and then you can um, that does all the heavy lifting in terms of the streaming. Okay, cool. All right, so a lot of good content to cover there. Um, another follow up question that Michael probably would have gotten after that would have been like, if you could redo this uh, project or this problem again, like what would you do differently? So just be prepared for something like that. Um, in terms of the answer itself, um, I was trying to make sure that, that he was gonna hit everything within the star technique, right? Situation, task, action, result. Uh, I did have to probe Michael a little bit on the result itself, but he did give really good context in terms of the situation. And he did a very good job explaining why it was a complex problem that he needed to solve, which is always very, very helpful because complex can mean different things to different people in different contexts. So that was really good that he was able to define and explain that. Um, one thing to I, I to point out as well is um, it's it's good to be able to hopefully anticipate some questions, right? Like if I ask you like what was a big problem, you should immediately be thinking, okay, I'm gonna explain the problem, but then I'm also gonna tell them how I fixed it, right? So that's also something to kind of be aware about. And as you do more interviews um, for for folks watching at home, um, you'll you'll start to understand and be able to predict follow up questions. And if you are able to address those before they're even asked, that's a really great way of standing out and showing your 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 interviewing skills and proficiency. Uh, which is always going to be very, very helpful. Um, now, I feel like there was a big opportunity for you as well, Michael, when you were talking about um, how there were, how your problem was not unique just to your 
um, team or your situation, the audio file or basically how um, files or, or data is captured. There are gaps for not just you, but everyone else who has to pull the data from the car. So I was hoping you were going to be talking about like some scalable solution or program or something you created that obviously solves your problem, but then would help solve other problems for the rest of the company. Um, and oh. I think you were trying to talk a little bit about that. You talked about like you built a C++ library, but then you kind of like skipped over it and then went back to the problem that you were solving um, itself, which is fine because you answered the question. But if you're thinking about like, what's an answer that would blow someone's mind, definitely trying to think about scalability and helping not just your, your team and yourself, but the broader company, because there was a great opportunity there, right? Um, and I was hoping you were going to go back and explain a, a little bit more about that. Because as a manager, that's what I would love, right? Knowing that if, if Michael finds a problem, a, he'll be able to figure it out and solve it on his own. But B, he's going to find a way to help everyone else who may have a similar problem, right? Especially on the engineering side um, at companies, especially Google and other companies, they're very team-based. And this is what Michael was talking about earlier, which is why he wanted to get into software engineering. Because everything is team-based and everyone is trying to help each other, be successful, et cetera, that's definitely something that any engineer, any manager, et cetera, anyone applying for interviewing or for, for engineering roles should always keep in mind. So, cool. Let me just check the chat and see if anything else is coming up. No questions in here yet. So uh, guys, if you have any questions or um, want us to run through some, some tough interview questions, put them down in the chat and uh, We'll try and get through them. So I think I just have one more practice question for Michael, and then we'll be all done. And I'll see if there's anyone in the chat that has anything to cover. So we did some of the general cognitive ability questions. OK, let's do, let's do this one. Michael, tell me about a time that you went above and beyond in your role. Why did you feel that you wanted to go the extra mile for that particular instance or project? Yeah, sure. sure. So um, at Zoox, I was probably the first front end specialist they hired. And my manager knowing that, um, they would have other teams kind of like coming to my team uh, asking for support. And one of the teams was the perception tooling team so they had just hired in a new hire like i think a new grad just straight out of masters and she had no experience with um any like like any front end uh you know software development at all uh much less like the the framework that we used so uh, not only did i like sit down with her multiple times uh like uh throughout the week I would also like follow up with her, make sure she, she didn't have any questions or anything that was blocking her. Uh, I would, I'd, I'd make myself super available. Um, I was also trying to not only just like act as like a stack overflow or Google resource for her, but also I was trying to like impart skills so that she could unblock herself as well. And I can't, I saw that it came to fruition later down the line, maybe after about a quarter, cause I noticed that we would sit down much less. Um, the things that I think would take a little bit more time were like more on the design and and like getting a better sense of like what's good you like user experience. Uh, but I I felt like she was on the right path in terms of improvement. Okay. All right. And. Uh, da, da, da. And so I guess going back to my to my initial question, right? Like, why did you feel the need or why did you want to kind of go that extra mile for her um, or him? Because I, th I kind of reminded me of myself. Like I, you know, I, I, when I first joined 500 miles, I didn't, um, like, I didn't really have a mentor, so to say, like, like an expert on, on the domain that I was working on. So, uh, and I feel like, because I was in your shoes once and I remember very clearly that, and it can have like a lasting impact on your career that I wanted to also try and provide like the most positive, most positive experience that she could have as well. So maybe that she could also pass down this, this knowledge. Okay, cool. And then in terms of business impact or I guess team impact, um, I, I know you mentioned she was meeting with you less and less, but um, I guess, have you seen 
or were you able to see the impact she was able to have on the product itself or, or, or anything like that? Yeah, definitely. So because of her, the, the tooling for in the perception tools team, um, definitely de like she, she basically was handed like entire projects by her, on her own. So I think she became very autonomous, like very quickly. Okay, cool. So this question essentially was designed to obviously see if Michael is a good person <laughs> and if he would go above and beyond um, for a role, uh, regardless of where you get hired. This is something that anyone is going to want in their new hire. And also, um, it's just kind of to see what motivates Michael as well in terms of like what would what would the situation need to be or what would the environment need to be set up in order for him to, to give 110%. Right. And it was good that he was able to talk about more soft skills. Right. Basically, he wants to coach and mentor and is willing to take the time out, even though he may be really busy to help others, which is great. And the impact itself sounds like they were able to kind of ramp up and, and work on projects as well, which is good. Um, now, I think one thing to also kind of challenge and think about as well here is um, if I were to summarize, the question was, give me an example of a time you went above and beyond. And your response was, oh, I helped a coworker ramp up, right? Which is good, but overall, I, I think that there are probably stronger examples that you may have if you kind of do a deep dive on your resume itself. Like think about something really unique that you don't think a lot of other candidates maybe would be presenting during the, an, an interview, right? Because how many people are gonna say, oh, there was someone that was new and I was already here. So I trained them to get them up to speed so they would be able to work efficiently at my company, right? So this is your chance to like show them like either from a technical side or from a non-technical side, right? Like something that would really blow away your interviewer and they're gonna be judging, I would say the magnitude of your response, right? And this, and in this particular instance, the the example you choose to share is very, very important and will set you up for success or failure. So just something to kind of think about. All right, uh, we'll do another check in the chat. Uh, doesn't seem like there's any other questions or things like that, but uh, yeah, um, that's pretty much almost a full hour of prep work. Did you have any questions or any comments um, as we went through this whole practice session, Michael? Uh, no, I think it was, it was very enlightening and I think there's like a lot more things that I can improve upon. So thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks no, of course. For yeah, of course. Happy to help. And then I guess for those of you who are preparing for engineering um, interviews and exams, yes, the technical side is probably the most important. I would say it's like 60 to 70 percent of what they care about. But a lot of companies now, especially after what's been going on in the news and things like that, they're really going to focus on these non-technical questions as well. So you're going to need to be buttoned up on both ends, right? Um, I think the perception is if I'm good at coding or I can pass these technical interviews, I can get any job I want. And especially with the people that I've been coaching as well, I just kind of want to challenge that and just make sure that you are spending the time like Michael is right now, investing in yourself and practicing some of these non-technical questions because this is ultimately what's gonna you know, make or break you, especially at top tier companies like the Googles, the Apples, the Facebooks. And right now when the market is so competitive, if, if person A and person B both pass a coding exam, then how are you gonna choose who you're gonna pick, right? Then ultimately it's gonna come down to the non-technical skills. So I just really wanna make sure that that's abundantly clear for everybody. So they are very, very important. And kudos to Michael for recognizing that and you know working on them here today. And I guess, yeah, I don't see anything in the chat. So we're pretty much all done. I just wanna do a quick plug for myself. If you guys, oh no, did I stop sharing? There we go. Um, I do have a YouTube channel. If you guys want some like other interviewing tips and tricks and things like that, please check it out. It's just uh, career shakers, all one word. So that's my little plug. And Albert, I am done. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, both of you, for spending your time with us uh, this e this evening. Um, it's bright, so I want to say evening may not even be evening anymore. And for those of you watching, thank you for tuning in. I truly appreciate all of you spending your, some of your time uh, during this pandemic as we level up in our careers and figure out where to go next, especially with 
so many unemployed. And so if you walked away learning something, please let us know and apply this hopefully to your own job search as the days go by. So we're continuing to help you through the transition of COVID-19 with more content. Tomorrow, we're speaking to Grania Callen, founder of the Callen Law Group. She'll be discussing the legal implications of heading back to work as businesses reopen and what laws protect you in this age of social distancing, wearing face masks, and so much more. So feel free to join us tomorrow with your questions, uh, what uh, situations that you think you may be facing as you head back in the office, and much more. Before then, we'll see you in the community with your introductions, advice, and your success stories. Until then, take care of yourself, stay on the grind, and good luck. Thank you, everybody, and good night.